So this is the uh, first day of February, 2005, and it uh, seems like time is going by very quickly. One month, January has passed, and so time is is like that. It uh, you get been to notice experience time, not just believe in time. Like time as a perception, it's a, we have the past, present, future, and the uh, conditioned realm that we identify with, and these are all, you know, based on the the uh, convention of, of time as reality. But in meditation, we're actually, uh, when you're developing awareness, practicing awareness, sati sampatanya, then actually that's uh, you're transcending time itself. When you start thinking about what time it is, then you're back in the time realm. And uh, think a long time or a short time, a lifetime, or just your own age. You know, uh, what the, I find uh, having the perception of being 70 years old is an uh, interesting one because uh, the perception of 70 years seems like a long time. I always perceived somebody is who's seventy as being very old. But in the timeless, timeless realm, there's nothing. There's no. There's nothing to get old. So the more mindful, more the, the rest in awareness, and then the sense of of being anything, or being 70, or being anybody at all, ca- falls away. The year 2005 is another perception, because the, the Buddhist uh, date is uh, 2,548. And that's the, the Buddhist year, then the Christian year is 2005. So we have ways of designating time, the passage of time, and now uh, 2004, right now, is a memory, isn't it? So when we think of last year, 2004, and now we're in 2005, 2006 is uh, is the future. Next year. But the aim of uh, 
Buddhist meditation, the bhavana, practice of bhavana, means uh, transcending time, the santitiko akalika dhamma. When we translate it, uh, akalika dhamma means the timeless. So uh, this is like to to contemplate what is timelessness, you know, not through, not trying to analyze it or or define it in any way, but recognize it. Realize it. <coughs> so that's where one needs to let go of trying to analyze or figure it all out according to uh, words and perceptions and so forth, but to to recognize the reality of timelessness, which is here and now. So how do you do that? When we say we practice mindfulness, and of course when we, we even the word mindfulness, or sati sampachanya, or awareness, all these are words, and then we, we define the words, we want to know what they mean. And so that uh, we attach to to definitions, meaning, explanations, and think we understand because we might have a, a good explanation or good definition. But in that uh, realm of analysis and explanation, definition, means that we're still... Uh, limited to to the thinking mind. That's why I encourage this um, practice of awareness to get beyond the thinking, to, to uh, let go of the thinking process, to recognize that which is behind thought, behind the emotion that arises, there the liking or disliking or preferences, ideas, opinions and views. So then in uh, realizing Dhamma, and so this word Dhamma then is the, is the Buddhist word that is not to be defined and described, but to be recognized, realized. So in uh, Buddha and Dhamma, this is our refuge, the, the awareness, the ability for each one of us at this moment, an individual human entity sitting here, um, aware the Bhutto. This is the awakened conscious state of being. It's not, it's not a person, uh, and it's not a, you can't define it, it's a, it's a reality. As soon as you start thinking about whether you're aware or not, or if, you're, if you really understand what I'm talking about, then you're caught in the doubting mind. Doubt always is a result of thinking. And uh, so when you try to figure it out and, and or claim that in, in any way through language or thought that, that you are the Bhutto uh, seeing the Dhamma, then that is a, merely a convention that can, then that can be deluding to us. It's getting beyond even the conventions of Buddhism of Theravada Buddhism, of Pali, and all the rest, to, to recognize and realize reality. Realize reality, that's a... Or to recognize reality. Or that which is real. So in order to do this, then it's the matter of trusting in your own awareness. Uh, I've given so many kind of uh, examples of how to do that. Uh, to, to let go of thinking is not an easy thing for us to do, usually. It's, we're very attached 
very uh, bound into thinking as reality. Unless we have a name for something and we have a definition of it, then we we feel we we understand or we know something when we have a form an opinion or have a feeling about this or that. When we, in this present moment then, <coughs> going to the reality of this moment, uh, the body that's uh, existing at this present moment, but if we don't claim it or define it in, in a personal way, or look at it in a conventional way, but just recognize the, the reality experience of a human body at this present moment. What is that like? And it's, we don't, you know, this is a quite an, an unusual way to talk because uh, the human body is usually very much some, something that we never question is our reality. We are identified with it and we and we uh, have views and opinions about our own bodies, and we uh, um, think we we know them or understand them in some way through scientific explanations. But that's not it, isn't it? Try to to uh, figure out the human body and through anatomy, physiology, through modern science, but simple simple ability of recognizing the reality of the body as one is experiencing it right now. So the, like the four postures the, is, a, is a reference point, sitting, standing, walking, lying down. The movement of the body that we use throughout the day and night. So in the, when we practice the four foundations of mindfulness, the the first foundation of mi mindfulness is the Gayanupasana Satipatthana, or the mindfulness of the body, is a foundation, a foundation for mindfulness, sati, Satipatthana. <coughs> so the body's breathing, and it's uh, it's, uh, you know, one, one recognize, you don't have to look at it, you don't have to open your eyes and start looking at your body, but, uh, and, and trying to figure it out through vision, but just the consciousness that we're experiencing at this present moment of the, of the existence uh, as we experience this, this form. So right now, say for example, sitting here, just being aware where my hands, my hands or my feet, or the pressure of sitting on the seat, the heat or the, the temperature that I'm experiencing right now is like this. And so we can, we can focus on a, on a part of the body or on the body as a whole experience, but the, because an awareness, Sati Sampatanya, allows us to to uh, bring the body as a, as a thing that is present in consciousness, as experienced now, not through perceiving it or in any way, in any fixed way or any defined way, but through this intuitive sense, intuitive awareness. Uh, right now, just notice my, the sensations in my legs, feet. Suddenly, just recognize that my left elbow is touching the, the back of the of this uh, seat. This contact, the pressure, the the uh, of my robes on my skin. It's opening up to the, to that which is 
happening, what one is experiencing right now, which, uh, unless, you know, if it gets extreme, like one is having a lot of pain or something, then then uh, one tends to pay attention to to that or usually react to it, trying to get rid of it. But just the the recep- receptivity, like awareness is being receptive to this reality, this experience here and now. Which is a different way, isn't it, of, of uh, operating, this because it doesn't a thought process, it's just recognizing that which is happening through, uh, through the body, through consciousness at this very moment. It's like this, the way it is. So it's a foundation for mindfulness because wherever we are, uh, our body's with us. You know, (laughs) sitting here or walking or in London or in an airplane or whatever, your body is with you. It's something that you can always refer to, always open to. (laughs) And yet, we can also live in our own heads, you know, like the... uh, Ivory Tower intellectual, the kind of caricature of a, of a, an ivory of an absent-minded professor or uh, a person that lives in his or her head. I mean, one can live in a, in a world of thoughts and perceptions and memories and and completely uh, dismiss the body till it starts kind of demanding attention. So, like, we can k- kind of dismiss, like, in, 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 in my own experience, uh, uh, this uh, right foot of mine, which is, it draws a lot of attention to it. Everybody wants to, uh, wonders what's wrong with my right foot because it's swollen. And, uh, and they, you know, then they think it's something serious. Uh, and, uh, and this actually is a resultant karma of ignoring my feet when I was younger. <laughs> uh, because when I didn't uh, want to be bothered with my feet because I was too much up in the head until uh, the feet became so demanding and I had to pay attention to them. I had to bring attention to to these very useful uh, the usual useful part of the body that we walk on you know, that was necessary to walk <coughs> but yet um, when I first started meditation I was not interested in my feet at all I, I was interested in getting jhanas and getting stages and getting enlightened and and getting somewhere, you know, the, the kind of up in the brain type of of interest in Dhamma. And anything so banal and uninteresting as, as my feet couldn't be bothered with. So I didn't take very good care of them. I, I injured the foot uh, before I was a monk when I was living in, uh, in Malaysia, in the state of Sabah and uh, injured it somehow, and, and it was uh, in a terrible kind of infection, which, um, you know, was very painful and, and, and very, uh, you know, it, it caused some kind of damage to the circulation. So when I became a monk in Thailand, uh, several years later, you know, I. Uh, and you have to go barefoot when you go on the uh, alms round in the bata, you go barefoot so and then i I wasn't all that mindful of my feet, so I'd dub my toe i'd I'd uh, cut my feet in some way, and then they'd become infected, and then the leg would swell up and get cellulitis and so during my years in Thailand, I don't know how many months I spent in hospitals trying to you know cure cellulitis infections in this 
in this le right leg. So then I began to get the idea that maybe I should do more body awareness. That the body is, I mean, Lung Po Cha was certainly encouraging that. <coughs> but actually I found that quite difficult because I was not, you know, I didn't find it, you know, I, I wasn't interested in that. Just the, the, just the simple reality of having a, a physical body. I was more interested in getting tranquilized, having the kind of tranquility experiences. You get kind of blissed out in, in, uh, through concentration. So then the, the uh, uh, you know, the, so then I've had to, so th this has been going on for 40 years now, so it's not anything that serious, but it, but I'm just using this as an example of, of, uh, you know, living up in the head so much and not wanting to be bothered with the reality of, of one's own feet. And yet, uh, the feet are quite important, you know, to, uh, for one's convenience in this life, to, walk from here to there. Bringing attention to the feet, the feet were demanding attention, so I started meditating on my feet, just bringing them into consciousness, just noticing them, the feelings, the sensations, the, the energies that one experiences through the feet and the legs, through the hands, the arms, shoulders, trunk of the body, the 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 neck throat the face all the the sensitive sense organs the eyes ears nose tongue so it's a foundation for mindfulness not something to to just say it's impermanent not self and then dismiss it or to to exaggerate its importance, vanity, or, or um, you know, trying to have perfect health and and trying to you know perfect the, the human body according to ideas or fashions of the time is not it either. It's not not a matter of identity or judgment or or trying to to make it immortal or perfect but to uh, receive it, recognize it. It's a use, it's a part of our experience here and now. The human body that's sitting here. Consciousness, the conscious form in the universe. So in, in, in various ways of, of uh, body contemplation, the four elements, the earth, fire, water, and air, the, just the, uh, the breathing, the, the heat, uh, the temperature that one is experiencing, sensation, pleasure, painful, neutral, the posture. These are, these are words that, 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 w that encourage us to look at the reality of that those words are pointing to. They aren't to be just grasped and, and reiterated, but to, to uh, examine, investigate the reality of the fire element, the heat element, the air element, the water element, the liquid element, the, the solid element or the earth element. We live at a time where there is a tremendous uh, kind of it's very materialistic time and and a time where people are very strongly identified with their appearance, with their gender, with their age, 
uh, we were talking to Tease this evening about the, how plas uh, plastic surgeons make a lot of money these days. Everybody wants to uh, improve their appearance through surgery. <laughs> and, and how, you know, people, you know, feel, that, you know, that have to be, a look a certain way to be acceptable or to be beautiful or better looking. <coughs> but these all come from ignorance, from, from not understanding Dhamma, that we, we uh, obsess ourselves with these kind of, of perception. So Gayanupasana Satipatthana is not to despise, diminish, to uh, negate the body, but to bring it into consciousness. Like consciousness, we're able to receive the experience of sitting at this moment. Which is non-personal, it's not, it's not judgmental, it's not saying anything about how beautiful, ugly, or good or bad the body is. It's just, it's receiving the reality of this condition, this, this earthbound condition, this temporary condition that we're uh, experiencing at this present moment. <coughs> so then anapanasati, mindfulness of the breath, and the body breathes, and we can be conscious of breathing and uh, be aware of the inhalation, exhalation. So consciousness is, is our is uh, like when we're born, we're born as a conscious entity. And so we have a form separate, say, when we born from the womb of our mother, then then we start operating, uh, conventionally speaking, as a separate, en separate conscious entity. But consciousness is, is uh, combined with sati, and then sati and panya, wisdom and awareness, then this is a way of, of receiving the, r the presence of this condition without the, the habit patterns of identity, of, pers of seeing it, in it through personal perceptions, through critical perceptions. So consciousness is uh, like uh, this is the realm that we're living in. It's, it's, it's a conscious realm. Consciousness has no boundary, no limit to it. So it's one of the immeasurables. But we usually don't recognize that because we're, b we're always bound to that which you can measure, that which begins and ends, or the, the body itself, or the thoughts, or views, or opinions, or feelings, sensations uh, that are very dependent on other conditions supporting them. So the impermanent contemplation of anicca, the pace and karanicca, all conditions are impermanent, is to liberate ourselves, to free ourselves from that limitation of binding ourselves to condition that are, when, if you bind yourself to a condition then uh, out of ignorance, out of not understanding Dharma, not having seen the reality, then we, we tend to always be limited to the conditions that we're attached to. It's obvious, isn't it? If I am this body, then, then I am limited to that as, rea as my reality. But the very ability that, that I have right now to receive the experience of this body 
in consciousness means that I'm not attaching to the body, I'm not identifying, I'm not criticizing or, or praising or doing anything, with, but just receiving the experience of this physical body sitting here now. <coughs> so the, b the body then is, uh, it arises in consciousness as the, the reality of, of it, it, you know, it's a impermanent, you, you feel the, the pulsations, the, the different sensations that one is experiencing now, is definitely a moving, changing condition of being hot or cold or pleasure, painful sensations, breath, yeah, inhales and then exhales. And that which is aware of inhaling and exhaling. So like mindfulness of the breath, isn't it? You're the awareness of the breath. You're not making it into some kind of personal uh, identity, my breath and my inhalations or exhalations, isn't it? We're, the, we're not, is the breath isn't usually something that, that brings forth a sense of ownership, uh, or a kind of personal uh, sense of one's uh, goodness or badness, but it is what it is. The long breath or short breath or we breathing, breathing is easy or difficult, but the body is breathing. We're not telling it to breathe. We're not forcing it to do that. It, it does it all on its own. And so the awareness of the breath, you know, question yourself. What, what is it that's aware of this inhalation? So you're, you're putting the, the breathing of the body, uh, seeing it in terms of a sankhara, what it is, you know, you inhalation is like this, exhalation is like this. And this kind of questioning also, what is it or, you know, who is it? But, but I found who doesn't work very well because it's too personal. It means that there's somebody who is a conveys a sense of somebody, but what what is it? What is it that is able to be aware of this inhalation, exhalation, breathing, or the, the posture or the experience of the body sitting at this moment? What is it that's aware? <coughs> so there's consciousness, isn't it? For to become a person, I have to start thinking, that's my breath, my consciousness, my body. But if I don't claim it, if there's no thought, but just trusting in the awareness, awareness, uh, you, you know, is a, you're aware from the beginning of the inhalation to the end of the inhalation, and the beginning of the exhalation. So the awareness, conscious awareness then, is the receptacle for sankhara or conditioned phenomena. So in the human form, in this, on this planet, this sense realm, is uh, this the sense realm, isn't it? The, we have sense organs, there's sensitivity. This is a feeling realm that we're experiencing from birth to death. And our life is a, just an endless experience of different sensations, things impinging on the senses. <coughs> so it's, uh, you know, it is a, it is a, you know, when you, we're so used to it, we don't contemplate what it really is. We just tend to develop reactions, you know, through ignorance, through desire, through fear, through experience, through memory. You know, we, we have certain preferences and, and uh, longings, wanting happiness and pleasurable sensations, having 
beauty, and then the fear of, of, of having the opposite, of not wanting to look at things that are ugly or painful. But the sense realm is like this. And, you know, so we're not, we're not interested anymore in the quality of the, of the uh, experience, but recognizing the characteristic of sankara. As impermanence. And that which is aware of impermanence is the only point, the only place, this, this center point, this uh, through awareness that, that can receive the breathing, the, the the sensation of the body, the feelings, the the thoughts, the the all the uh, pleasure, pain, the views and opinions, the whole lot of sankharas is received through awareness. So uh, awareness then is a uh, is holistic. It's 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 a. Uh, it's our ability to to not divide this moment into past and future or me and mine or you and good and bad and right and wrong. And I said before, sati panya, mindfulness wisdom, isn't isn't critical. It doesn't make judgments about the conditions we're experiencing, it's recognizing them. Panya, in this sense, means discerning, discerning sankharas as sankharas. They are the way they are. <coughs> so an inhalation is like this, an exhalation is like this. I'm not trying to say that one inhalation, that inhalation is better than ex exhaling, Thing like that. It's not, not to, to uh, compare or prefer, but recognize the way it is. And the, the second foundation of mindfulness is Vedana Nupasana Sati. Vedana. Vedana Nupasana looking into, insight into, feeling as a foundation of mindfulness. Feeling or vedana, sukha vedana, pleasurable feeling, dukkha vedana, unpleasant feeling, atukha matsukha vedana, neither pleasant nor unpleasant or neutral feeling. So as a sense realm, is a feeling realm, isn't it? It's uh, the way it is. There's pleasure, pain, and neutral. Uh, in ignorance, when avicca is the motivating factor, the where we're operating out of avicca, then we, we're just caught in reacting to Vedana in this realm. So pleasure, beauty, uh, the good and all that we we want, we like, we'd like to own, keep, make it mine. Gets very you know personal. Am I? I want to be really good. I want to be beautiful. I want to be healthy. I want to be uh, you know have all the best. I want to have just beauty to look at and and melodious sounds and good food and pleasant odors and all this, just the, the pleasure of the senses. <coughs> and then the then the uh, the dislike of the of its opposite and the, the, the kind of revulsion we have for for our own bodily functions or the the uh, 
just you know when you're looking at corpses or or uh, the decaying side of uh, life is repulsive we don't don't want to we don't want it we want to get rid of it run away from it and yet sati sampatanya satipanya is our ability to reflect on this on attraction repulsion neutral sensation or neutral sense impingement <laughs> I, pleasure and pain are ten, uh, you know, are extremes. Neutral, we generally don't notice neutral sensation. So because it's just not nothing in it that attracts attention. If it's neutral, we j we tend to to ignore it. So so when we, uh, you know, the bringing it. So in these three kinds of Vedana, pleasure, painful, neutral, these are encouraging us to examine, to look at, to recognize, to receive pleasure, pain, and neutral sensation through the senses, through the body. In a non-critical way, but through awareness, mindfulness, intuitive awareness so like when I were use the word in intuition it it's uh, this is a, a an English word but it it conveys this sense of embracing everything it's not uh, uh, it's not dividing anything at this moment it's receiving receptive conscious reception of that which is in this present moment. Because that's all there ever is, isn't it? And the experience is always here and now. Experience tomorrow is, is supposition, isn't it? Anticipation. When we think about tomorrow, experiencing something tomorrow, that's something we, we, we don't know yet not but always you know our th this present is where the present moment this here and now dhamma pachubana dhamma is is uh, it's all is our reality is real it's not it's not a a possibility in the future or it's not holding to a memory of past experience Now, neutral, like uh, mindfulness of the breath, for example, when I found at first it was when I first started practicing meditation before ordaining, I found it, I couldn't sustain much awareness on my breath because I was so obsessed with thoughts. Mind would just wander, I couldn't, and sometimes you couldn't even, you know, some people can't even find their breath. And you're teaching beginners, and you say, "Be aware of the breath." They they don't know what where it is. Say, "Well, you know, your nostrils. Uh, you feel <laughs> uh, the rise and fall of your abdomen." Because this is not something we're used to doing, you know, until we start meditating. <laughs> and then the the uh, obsessive thinking mind. You know, when you start immediately, you get caught into that and you wander away. So, so I used uh, mantra at first. Just using, I used the uh, mantra "let go" as a kind of way of of thinking, but limiting my thinking to two words, and uh, so that I wouldn't wander. So if I was going to, since I was so obsessed with thinking and couldn't stop it, I used thinking as a means at first to just think, but only think those two words. 
and be aware of thinking them. And that I found very effective at first. And then gradually the, the, the obsessive, overwhelming thought habit diminished and I could concentrate on, on the body, on the breath. So what is it that is aware of pleasure, a pleasurable sensation through the senses, or a painful one? Or what is it that can pay attention to neutral sensation? You don't have to wait till, till you're just experiencing pleasure or pain, but with uh, uh, reflecting on, on, uh, on the reality of this moment, so much of what we experience is neutral. Don't notice till I start looking, observing. I say the pressure of my robes on my skin is neutral. It isn't a sensation that, that I could describe as pleasurable or painful. <coughs> or even the looking at space, you know, just on visual level, observing space in this uh, temple. And then usually one doesn't really, really notice space because one, I, I'm, I say I would be conditioned to observe the the colors, the forms, the things in space. Space doesn't have any other quality than spaciousness. But if, if I start n observing space, mindfulness of the space, you know, I'm, I'm withdrawing my fascination or interest in the objects and resting in just the awareness of the space, which is here and now, right, which I can observe through sight, space as this reality. <coughs> so, so much, is, you know, the conditioned mind, we're um, um, conditioned consci consciousness with, with attachment to the habit patterns of conditioning, limit us always to the same old, thinking the same old thoughts and and seeing the same old things. It gets even more dreary as you get older. You, you get bored with just your own limitations. <coughs> Thinking the same old thoughts all the time. Reacting the same old way. And you, get, you, know, when you can see it in, in uh, old people that have not developed awareness. They just get stuck in saying the same things over and over or reacting the same way. Vedana, exploring Vedana is like just recognizing the power of at what is attractive to us through the senses or through the mind. What brings us pleasure, happiness? Uh, so, like beauty, say like a flower, beautiful flower, is is a very you know it's it's really uh, attractive. It, you know, your attention is drawn to it. Flowers demand attention; they want to be noticed. That's why they're beautiful. So, so then. Uh, one it looks at them, but feels attracted. When it starts turning brown and wilting, then we don't want to look at it, we throw it away. Observing this not, is not that we should find joy in looking at, at uh, rotting flowers and feel there's something immoral about being attracted to beauty or anything, because that takes judgment, isn't it? It's a judging tendency or forming views and opinions. But just recognizing 
uh, the power of this sense realm, of uh, its attractiveness, its ugliness, repulsiveness, and its neutral. Its neutralness. What is it that's aware of this, then? You ask yourself. It can be aware of beauty, of pleasure, of sukha vedana, of dukkha vedana. What is it that can be aware of a dukkha matsukha vedana? And that's the way this realm is. It's not personal, there's nothing, you know, ultimately good or bad about it, but it is the way it is. When we want to want to find out what is this realm? What is it for? You know, is it is there a purpose for this? Is there some ultimate purpose for human existence, for planetary life, for our solar system? Is there a creator of it all? Is what is behind it? What is the point? What is the meaning? And these are the the questions that we can we can spend our lives trying to answer. What what is the meaning of life? But then we're always stuck with trying to find answers to those questions, the meaning of life. And yet we're not aware, we're not awake to the reality of life as we're experiencing it now. So somebody says, well, you know, the meaning of life is that we're here in order to, to uh, be good, and so we'll go to heaven and live forever with God our creator and that that might satisfy some people and it does you know so some people take that and uh, that seems to uh, satisfy them in some way but that never satisfied me <laughs> I couldn't just go along with that in the meaning of life or the purpose what's my purpose on this in this lifetime, you know, what am I supposed to do? Or is it meaningless? Is human existence and planetary life is it just pointless? Is it just a cosmic accident? Is it totally without purpose? And then you're still caught in the thinking realm again, in the analytical realm, and trying to resolve that through ideas and thoughts and so the buddha pointed not to to trying to re to answer these questions but pointing to a way of realizing ultimate truth or the deathless then our purpose is to realize the deathless well <laughs> That's another another thought. Even give uh, you know give up trying to to claim that, and just trust in the awareness, not from some kind of person seeking uh, for some personal meaning to your life, but trusting in the innate ability and the imminence of being here and now. Meaning we we let go of these desires to become or know or or get rid of or to control or annihilate anything at all. The sense of sati sampatanya is more like it's a relaxing sense of opening, trusting this moment. Not trying to find some some ultimate meaning in this moment because then there's then there's a there's a desire, isn't it, to open this moment in order to, to have, to recognize or have some ultimate meaning to your life, but to trust in the awareness. This is, takes humility. It takes trust to surrender to this moment, to be open, vulnerable, receptive to that which is happening to this particular conscious form here and now without trying to uh, you know claim it or dismiss it or judge it, criticize it, blame anything but just trusting in the sati panya or the 
discerning ability of awareness and consciousness that that is innate in us this these human forms their their very the ability that that these human forms have to, is is uh, you know is our great uh, gift really in being human Then the uh, third foundation, mindfulness, jitanu pasna satipatthana. And uh, this is uh, jitta is a Pali word which means mental states or consciousness. It's uh, oftentimes uh, another word for consciousness. Being aware of, say, the mood, the emotion. The, the mental state that, that you're experiencing now. Not criticizing it, not you know, trying to make it any way at all, but recognizing it. Jittanu pasana, vipassana, looking into the jitta, into consciousness itself. being aware of consciousness. And then, of course, this is the, the, like the mood, the, the, the uh, sense of, of suffering or doubt or fear or anxiety, worry. The state of feeling expanded or contracted or whatever is, is awareness. Of the of the mind itself, the mental state, without judging. But what is it that's aware? Like if anger arises, if something conditions were to make you angry, suddenly come together right now. You know, when I can I can know w- w- that I that anger has arisen. Day before I. <coughs> Or meditated, I just, when somebody conditions would make me angry, then I just become an angry person. So I, you know, I'd be caught in this, this strong emotion of anger and, and either follow it in, you know, with words or action or try to suppress it. You know, thinking I shouldn't, shouldn't get angry. Try to hide it. So these are reactions. To to the to that emotion, but then when I began to recognize that anger is like this, the feeling of aversion or resentment, rage, uh, negative conditions towards uh, something that happened or towards somebody, something. What is it that's aware of anger? And so in asking that question, then you know, I find, you know, when I do that, then I have a way of, of receiving this anger. Not trying to figure out why I'm angry or whose fault it is or whether I should or shouldn't be, but it, using the experience for awareness. And by receiving that anger, then not... If I try to analyze it, then I get caught. You know, I'm angry because um, this and that. You said this to me, and that wasn't true, and you should apologize, and all like that. Is then I get caught. I'm bound to that emotion. But if I just receive that, and it's an energetic experience, and the strong energies arise, what is it that's aware of that? You know? And it's non-personal, isn't it? If I start making it personal and say, I'm angry. But if, the, if, I, if I trust in the awareness, then anger is like this. It's a sankara, it can rise and ceases. And in that receiving of, uh, of emotion, 
emotional feeling, of emotional energies, then that which is aware is receptive to those, but seeing them in terms of what they really are. They are what they are. So it's not, when I say they are what they are, this is a reflection, uh, using words to reflect, to, to not judge it in any way. Say what should or what I should or shouldn't feel at this moment, but whatever I'm feeling, it's this way. And I found this very, you know, with uh, my early years in Thailand with Lung Po Cha, he was, he was very much teaching the Jitanu Pasana style. At least this is how I picked it up anyway, because uh, of the uh, way he would. Uh, encourage us to to look at what we are feeling. What is dukkha? Is the limitation of monastic life? Is the hot weather? Are the mosquitoes? Isn't this, are these the cause of dukkha? Or is it because I I resist or fight or don't like or want something I don't have or not want what I have. And so just by questioning and reflecting and recognizing, beginning to recognize the suffering that I create. Now in, in life also, like when somebody, say, criticizes me, Somebody says something I don't want to hear. Then uh, on a personal level, I don't, you know, personally, on a personal level, I don't like to be criticized. <laughs> so uh, uh, I like praise, though. <laughs> but I don't like criticism. So that's a matter of liking and disliking, isn't it? That's personal. That's a personality thing. But on the level of awareness, then, then uh, like when being criticized, if I trust in the awareness, then I can uh, see, you know, I can be aware of the aversion I'm feeling or the, the fear or the resentment that I feel towards somebody's criticism. What is it that's aware of that then? If it's not me, I can't claim it as some kind of personality, you know, a gift that I have. It's a, the natural state, you know, of awakened attention. <coughs> so then, you know, contemplate this. What is the way out of suffering then? Is it through controlling everything so that there's only beauty and praise and goodness around you and, and no tsunamis, no earthquakes, no uh, ecological catastrophes? No, nothing, you know, we can just live in an ivory tower maybe, create a, a, a beautiful ivory tower to live in, a cocoon uh, that I create where everything is uh, that uh, is just m for my pleasure, my safety, my security as a person, you know, and that's madness, isn't it? That's a kind of madness. Because this realm is not like that. It's not an ivory tower. It's not a place to, to uh, seek, to establish, in, in, to find security in, in other words. It's very nature, you know, this realm, planetary life, the body itself, the planet, and the solar system, the whole lot is in this state of changing. It had a beginning and has an ending. So on the, by looking into the nature of conditioned phenomena, you lose your, your dependence on it, your identity with it. You're not, you're not limited to that or to any kind of purpose or meaning to life. You don't have to know who you are or what the purpose of your life is. 
because you can know reality, ultimate truth, here and now. You know, it's not, and that that isn't uh, dependent on condition. But it does take a kind of determination to to uh, you know a real determined sense of of investigating and seeing through and recognizing you know, honesty with with atta- uh, ignorance and desire and uh, and clinging avicca dana upadana avicca is the Pali word for this ignorance not knowing the dhamma and out of that ignorance then our desires take us over we want success happiness praise and good health and beauty and all the best and we don't want the op- the opposite So, say, meditation is not finding out who you are, it's just, you know, it's the, the investigation and recognition of what you're not. So, the anatta, you're not, you're not a limitation, in other words. You're not a condition. You're not a thing. You're not a, a body, or a pleasure, or painful feeling, or a neutral one, or a emotion, greed, greed, hatred or delusion or fear or desire or anything like that. Because these, these conditions can always be recognized by the knowing, by the intuitive awareness. So by sorting it out, your, your trust in, in awareness increases just by 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 investigating experience here and now. now. A lot of experience here and now is neither pleasurable nor painful. And so we get bored. We have a lot of boredom, dullness, um, restlessness, doubts arise. So the, these these kind of states are you know, quite some are quite. You know, we we tend to try to to uh, they can easily motivate us when we're bored to try to find something that interests us or just follow our aversion to you know to wanting to get rid of boredom, trying to get rid of restlessness, dullness. You know, if I went through quite. Long periods of just feeling very dull, mentally dull. And then not liking that, you know, wanting to have interesting, exciting thoughts or experiences, uh, things like this, because dullness is, is dreary and, and uh, you know, spend a life, my layman's life, tr- avoiding it trying to run away from anything dull or stupid or boring, meaningless, by seeking always a romance, adventure, and excitement. <laughs> so in monastic life, you have plenty of time to experience boredom and dullness, sleepiness, restlessness, <laughs> anxiety, worry, and, and uh, doubt, uncertainty, insecurity. But that which is aware of them, you see, what is it that is aware of boredom or restlessness? Tuning into that, then that, that awareness, then the Dhammanupasna Satipatthana is, uh, is uh, using the Dhamma teaching. Using the Four Noble Truths, the dependent origination, Paticca Samuppada, and, and it, these are skillful Dhamma teachings to be able to reflect on the way it is. 
the Dhamma, the ultimate, the deathless, Nibbana, Anatta, So then the, the uh, body, the breath, I point to this sound of silence, here and now. And if you develop that awareness around the sound of silence, then that has a continuity. It's like space. It has no boundary, and the thinking process stops, and your reflective ability increases. You're not just caught in the movement of things, but very strong sense of, of uh, unlimitedness, boundlessness, emptiness. So pointing to, it's not a created, it's not like a sound that, that has an origin that you can find or an end. It's just a recognizing it, re remembering it. So the, these are the three, <coughs> say, I use the, the, the body, the breath, and the sound of silence. It's always bringing the centering here and now to reflect on the, the what is happening, you know, in terms of emotion or thoughts or physical uh, experiences, sense, sense impressions. So during this retreat, now I encourage you to, to uh, have that kind of determination, you know, really um, determined to to use everything that's happening to you during this du during this moment in this moment and uh, and to to really trust your awareness don't try to figure out where, how if you're really aware or not just be aware trust that you try to you start questioning, am I really being aware or not? Then you're lost again. So don't try to figure out how aware you are. Just be, it's a natural state. It's a normal, natural state of being. It's just this. It is nothing special. So don't, don't think it's an attainment or some highly evolved state that, that maybe people like myself who've meditated for years have. It's a normal, natural state of being. If you were never aware, you'd be dead by now. You would have died a long time ago. <coughs> it's just recognizing it and really appreciating and trusting it. So in these, this uh, reflection this evening is the point of bringing attention to here and now. What is aware of the body sitting, of the breath, of the sound of silence? And then that kind of inquiring form, yeah. you become more confident <coughs> in being awareness rather than trying to become, practicing hard on this winter's retreat to become somebody who's aware. You'll never succeed if, if that's your motivation. You're using this retreat to practice really hard to become somebody who's more and more aware. That's a basic delusion. So it's not a matter of becoming, trying to make yourself become somebody with more awareness, but re recognizing awareness is this. When I do this and I hear the sound of silence, everything belongs, you know, the the heat, the cold, the pleasure, the pain, the, the emotional reaction, the thoughts cease. 
And by recognizing that, then you develop, develop that confidence in it. You know, trust it. It's not, it's not a, a personal thing. It's not vanity. It's not ego. It's, uh, it's, it transcends all of that. You can see when, when you're just operating out of vanity or ego. But if you trust the awareness of that, then that is, then you, you, you cultivate this way of awareness, the bhavana. So I offer this as a reflection for this evening. Mm-hmm.